Danke für die Einladung. Es ist eine Ehre. If I got that right, let me say it in English to make sure. I would like to thank especially Stefan Ferdrick for the invitation to visit Leibniz University and to meet some truly wonderful colleagues and students. It is truly an honor to be here. So when it comes to the study of ancient societies, there is no problem that is more acknowledged and at the same time more ignored than that of a problem of religion. Almost every book written on the subject, no matter the discipline or the field, will premise in its introduction that there is no native or equivalent term that can satisfactorily translate our modern concept religion, yet the rest of the book will be on this or that ancient religion and therefore proceed as if the acknowledgement in the introduction almost did not occur which is kind of a curiosity to me, um, or an interest, something intriguing. In the last decade, though, um, some scholars, especially from the field of religious studies, have been quite critical and argue... Now, the, there has been criticism of the term religion from many scholars for, for many years, but especially from scholars that are um, interested in religion in the ancient world. That's why what I mean by in the last decades. In the last decade. So they have been quite critical and argued that the term religion should not be used in describing ancient societies as it distorts the material and non-material artifacts of those societies. So too, I thought that the problem we are facing as scholars who study the ancient world is whether we should use the term religion or not. Halfway through my PhD, though, I began to realize that the issue might lie elsewhere, a realization that informed a shift in my approach, which I would like to discuss with you today. Most Recently, I have written about this in a Feshrift contribution forthcoming later this year for Willie Brown, a scholar of early Christianity who has been my PhD supervisor and very influential in the way I approach the ancient Greek world. In fact, Brown delivered a lecture here in Hanover 10 years ago as part of the same program, um, during which time I was actually in Canada doing my PhD making that shift I will be discussing today. So I thought it fitting to present to you today part of this uh, forthcoming paper, which is also part of a larger project, a uh, research interest of mine that I'm currently working. So Brown's work has been very important to the way I approach the ancient Greek world. His work among a group of like-minded religious studies scholars, among which is Russell McCutcheon, who also gave a lecture here several years ago, Jonathan Z. Smith and Bruce Lincoln, to name just a few, made me rethink not only the concept of religion and its derivatives, as a self-evident concept in the scholarly works of the ancient Greek world, but also to rethink the way I was approaching the ancient material in general. For in my reading of his work, I saw an invitation to a shift of approach in how we describe and use the past. For example, in his article, The Past as Simulacrum in the Canonical Narratives of Christian Origins, Brown uses as his exemplum the way Jesus was represented in the canonical narratives of Christian origins in order to discuss the concept of history and the role it played in Christian thought. That is, his example serves as a way to discuss a larger theoretical question that involves history and history writing. He proposes that Christian origins be understood as a simulacrum, that is, a representation of the past made by scholars and ordinary people alike, a process that ends up revealing more about the present than the past. Brown concludes that article by proposing a shift of approach in the way we read early Christian literature. As he writes, quote, an extraordinary interesting and world worthwhile thing to do is to read the early Christian literature as exemplars 
cases in point of a theory of historical production that begins with real intentional human doings in the past and ends with the creation of the simulacrum of the canonical historical narrative in the present. Observing the processes at work in this sort of elongated chronology of production puts us in a good position to think deeply about the question why we invest so much in the past and why it is so important that the past looks just so rather than just any old way and why it is important why it is apparently necessary to forget as much as we remember and why. What and how we remember is not so much a matter of the past as it is a matter of our present, uh, Brown concludes. So this, in my reading of it, uh, is a shift that most scholars who study the ancient world are yet to make. Despite the seeming progress in the field as it pertains to acknowledging the anachronism contained in the concept of religion. So to begin, first I would like to discuss four fairly recent books that are indicative of the debates that I mentioned earlier regarding the use or not of religion and consider the usefulness of their approach in the study of ancient religion and the past in general. Second, turning my attention to Brown's call for a shift in our approach, I will propose a way forward and the gains in no longer assume so easily that our claims about the past are in a one-on-one -on -one relationship to what might have actually uh, taken place. So a long tradition in the study of the ancient Greek world has assumed that there is a way to accurately describe the past by paying attention to the ancient people themselves and by trying to understand the meaning of their text and of their material artifacts, oftentimes by looking at the context in which they appear. The first book I would like to discuss and which is indicative of this approach is the work of John Michelson, a very well-known classicist and scholar of the ancient world, of the ancient Greek world. And the preface of his 2010 second edition book, Ancient Greek Religion, he writes the following, quote, this book is largely descriptive based on the ancient evidence that survives and it limits discussion of modern theoretical interpretations of these complex subjects. Over the last 150 years, a number of theoretical systems to explain major elements of Greek religion have come and sometimes gone. These theoretical approaches hold great interest in themselves, but one needs to know what the Greeks themselves did and said about their religion before one can adequately apply or evaluate the various theoretical systems to explain it all." End quote. With Brown's work in mind, there are two things that are of interest in Michael's statement. First, Michelson is making an interesting distinction that, on the one hand, description is a natural or neutral way to present information about the ancient world, and on the other, modern theoretical interpretations of that information, although interesting, are simply secondary. Second, building on this distinction and despite recognizing the importance of theoretical approaches, he argues that primarily one should pay attention to the origins, to the people themselves and to their religion. As suggested above, this is a common scholarly move that often takes the form of studying people or texts on their own terms. Michelson therefore explicitly suggests that before we move to any meta-analysis, that is modern theoretical interpretations, we should be paying attention to ancient religion itself and to ancient people's own voices. That somehow religion and religious data are self-evidently and naturally found in the ancient Greek world. In fact, they are so obvious that Michelson does not think is necessary to provide a definition of religion as he is able to tune in into the people of the ancient world, see their religion the way they did, and thus describe it for his readers. Perhaps I should emphasize that although Michelson appears to speak on behalf of ancient Greeks, that is simply describing what they did and said, 
It is ironic that not even once in his book there is the acknowledgement that religion is not a native term, an acknowledgement that most scholars would admit to. In fact, in many occasions he translates ancient Greek terms with the term religion and religious, terms like Eusebia and Osio, for example, which have a far more complicated usage and meaning in ancient Greek uh, texts that does not correspond to our modern notion of religion, that is, as a private feeling of belief in gods. Michelson's approach is a perfect example of what Brad Nongbri nicely critiques in his book Before Religion, that is the common I know it when I see it approach to the study of ancient religion. This approach is often justified by the claim that if a culture has beliefs in gods, and we should put beliefs in quotation marks because it's far more complicated of a term, and rituals related to them, then that's sufficient indication that there was religion or that the people were religious, whether they use a term or not in their own self-representations. Some scholars have found this sort of approach problematic and try to offer alternative ways to study to the study of the ancient Greco-Roman world. Among such scholars is Brent Nongbri. In his already mentioned 2015 book, Before Religion, A History of a Modern Concept, Nongbri takes a rather different approach from that advanced by Michelson, attempting instead to historicize the term religion by arguing that it is solely a modern category. In doing so, Nongbri makes a very significant contribution to an ongoing and by now fieldwide discussion regarding its usefulness or not, especially in relation to how we study ancient people who lacked that very category. The points that Nongbri makes in, in the book regarding the history of the emergence of the word religion and its significant changes in different periods nicely illustrates that despite Michelson's approach Modern categories are not neutral descriptors of apparently stable things that, that are just out there in the past, but instead are driven by scholarly interest, a point that nicely places him along with Brown's call to a shift of approach. Yet, despite Nongbri critiquing the ease with which scholars, especially those who study antiquity, project this modern term religion in the ancient world, thereby identifying its anachronistic usage, at the end of his book, he suggests that this problematic approach may distort how ancient people themselves might have described their own worlds or how they might have understood their own local words that we commonly translate into religion. Intent to correct this distortion, Nongbri argues that although informed and strategic deployment of anachronism on the level of description doesn't necessarily exclude religion, when talking about ancient people, alternative vocabulary, Nongbri suggests, such as tradition, ethnicity, hearsay, uh, hearsay, no, heresy, <laughs> may prove to be more appropriate in describing the ancient world, concluding that, quote, the different type of descriptive accounts that I have in mind would allow what we have been calling ancient religions that is the contents of all these books called Mesopotamian religion, religions in Rome, ancient Greek religions, etc., to be disaggregated and rearranged in ways that correspond better to ancient people's own organizational schemes. Although far closer to answering Brown's challenge than was Michelson's more traditional approach, Nongbri's effort to acknowledge our anachronisms thereby signaling our recognition of the gap between the modern us and the ancient them, generalizations that we should also be mindful of, still results in an effort to bridge that historical gap by devising a way to get behind or beyond representation. However, the alternative vocabulary he proposes, though it may seem to be solving somehow the problem, the problem of religion, may insert new problems given that, not unlike religion, these words also come with their own modern baggage and history. It seems then that the problem is not religion per se, 
Instead, I would argue the problem is our effort to bridge the gulf between ourselves and the ancients, for it is impossible to unsee particular data as our object of study. To be more explicit, the data that the, the concept religion allowed us to pull together in the first place from the archive of the past and then study remain what Brown refers to as the process of artificiality, which I will discuss later, for discussing the same artifacts, but under a different name, example calling the same thing tradition or ethnicity instead of religion or religious, may tell us nothing really about the actual ancient people and the way that they divided up and understood their world. Recalling Brown's focus on our representation of the past, it inevitably speaks instead of the way that we divide, organize, and therefore impose system in our world, imposed upon, in this case, material understood by us as ancient, as Greek, as Roman, etc. Similarly to Nongbri, Carleen Barton and Daniel Boyarin make another significant contribution in the study of the ancient Greco-Roman world with their 2016 book, Imagine No Religion, How Modern Abstractions Hide Ancient Realities. Having identified the modern problems with the word religion, they argue that the term is completely inadequate to use in describing the ancient Greco-Roman world. Furthermore, moving a step further, even from Nongbri, they completely get rid of the term religion, claiming that they are now able, once they completely got rid of the word, uh, they are able to code C in the ancient world, in the ancient material, what it was possible to see when we ceased to look for what was not there, that is religion and code. And so by lifting the distorting veil of religion from the data, they conclude that they, not unlike Michelson, are now able to see what is actually out there, the ancient realities of which their book subtitle speaks. But as discussed just above, arriving at this conclusion requires such authors either to forget or to overlook that simply getting rid of one frame, that is religion, by which previous scholars organized their artifacts and substituting another one, one that is equally theirs and thus equally modern, doesn't unveil anything. Instead, it simply makes possible a new form of modern organization, allowing new interpretations to be made of these new representations. And, which I think is where Barton and Boyari's book make a significant contribution, and very important in the study of the Greco-Roman world. But I would still maintain that none of these new descriptions and interpretations that they are arguing in their book are necessarily in some kind of a sink in some actual ancient reality. That they are somehow simply the voices of ancient people that are now heard on their own terms. Simply put, the ancient world that Barton and Boyarin claim to describe is no less posited by them than the one made possible by means of others using the term religion. In both cases, the ancient standard by which we might judge which of these readings was closer to the truth is still elusive, if that is, there is ever such a standard. The idea of letting the ancient voices be heard on their own terms or playing the role of the medium, assuming that we are somehow in sync with the intentions of ancient authors, brings me to the last book, which is indicative of an insisting pursuit in how scholars approach the ancient world and the past. Despite the above-mentioned books by Nongbri and that of Barton and Boyarin, which, as already mentioned, were published in 2015 and 2016, respectively, and which offer an overwhelming amount of evidence based also on years of scholarly critiques from the field that religion is indeed a modern concept and should either be used with caution or not at all, in 2017, we see the publication of a book and actually a lot more since then, entitled An Ancient Theory of Religion, Euhemerism from Antiquity to the Present. In the introduction of the book, the author Nicholas Rubekas makes certain acknowledgments showing that 
Unlike Michelson, he's fully aware not only of the criticism that the term religion has received in the last decades from scholars such as Nongri, as well as that of Barton and Boyarin, but also the issue regarding the defin definition of religion. But as he writes, quote, I maintain that for some ancient thinkers, including Euhemerus, religion was about beliefs in gods, end quote. And although he understands that this to be his, quote, stipulative definition, the book is an attempt to, quote, rectify one of the most ancient theories of religion to be found in an ancient Greek book written by Euhemerus. Now, it is widely known that sometime in the 3rd and 4th century BC, an author named Euhemerus wrote a text called Iera Anagraphi, or what scholars translate as sacred inscription. A text we must note that has not survived, but exists only in fragmentary form in translations and interpretations of yet other authors who wrote between 300 and 600 years after Euhemerus's time. For example, in the first century C, 300 or 400 years after Euhemerus is thought to have lived, an author named the other Sicilus references Euhemerus's idea, but the chapter of his book that scholars suggest most deals with Euhemerus is itself lost, which prompts an important correction in my account. The others did not reference Euhemerus, but rather was later said to have referenced him. Then, in the second century of the Common Era, an author named Ennius translates the sacred inscription, but his translation, we learn, is also lost. So yes, he is in fact said by even later writers to have translated it. By now, should begin to be apparent the difference between mere description of the past and representations of the past. Now, fragments of the Theodorus's reference to Euhemerus appear in the work of another author named Eusebius, who wrote in the 3rd century C, 200 years after the Theodorus and thus 600 years after Euhemerus. While fragments of Ennius's translation appear in the work of yet another author named Lactinius, also wrote around the 3rd century C, so this extremely suspect transmission history, one that strikes me as remarkably similar to the untrustworthy transmission history of the speeches on errors found in the prologue to Plato's Symposium, I think paints a rather bleak picture of any possible way to bridge the gap and reach the original lost text and therefore its meaning, if that is ever possible. Despite this apparent and very practical difficulty, the author, Rubecus, makes an archaeological effort to extract from the tertiary primary sources, that is Eusebius and Lactantius, that which constitutes Euhemerus's actual Euhemerism, and therefore his theory of religion. The author doesn't simply juxtapose his interpretation or construction of Euhemerus' Euhemerism as being yet another and possible, possibly more persuasive interpretation, a move that would allow him to speak about similarities and differences in the author who, is, who he is reading, but rather almost all of the other interpreters we learn, quote, mis misinterpret and occasionally misuse Euhemerus' theory from antiquity onwards and even more so today, end quote. This is a position that we surely see in many scholarly works on the ancient world, such as the three books already cited. That is, the common idea that previous scholarship, or scholarship with which we disagree, distorts, misappropriates, mutilates, and misunderstands the past. It is as if there exists some original, and thus authoritative standard, to which such authors somehow have access, despite the faulty, to say the least, transmission history that I've already described with Euhemerus' work.
Hence the interesting thing to me at least is not so much as to whether religion was or not actually present in a book that we don't really have, but the underlying struggle, the search for the Holy Grail, let's say, for the ability to access the past as it really is and understand it in its own terms. On several occasions, the author wisely cautions his readers to ask whose euhemerism scholars employ when they use euhemerism theory. Again, this cautionary remark and his rather sincere and helpful question is effective because either implicitly or explicitly, it presupposes an original standard, something that lies outside of later scholarly discourses and thus representations against which we can measure the later abuses. Similar to Michelson's distinction between we have description and then we have theories and interpretations. For in looking at the differences between Ennius, Theodorus, Eusebius, and Lactantius, Rebecca's rightly concludes, quote, the question here is not who conveys the original text, this is probably f lost forever, but what one can discern from the different versions and context within which the theory is presented, end quote. So although the probability here is intriguing, the author can somehow discern the original Euhemerus' theory of religion by paying attention to the various versions and their contexts. And so later on we read that, quote, Euhemerus' view of the heavenly or celestial gods radiates a sense of acceptance of their divinity regardless of the lack of sources that would clarify this issue beyond any doubt, end quote. Surprisingly enough, despite the suspect transmission history itemized above and despite the author's own admission of the lack of sources, we are back to the original, Euhemerus' own view and not Rebecca's version of it. Somehow the original apparently is not really lost since the author seems to function as a mediator of sorts, like errors in Plato's symposium, moving between the two realms, that of distortion what we instead might also call discourses or representations, and originals, all in his effort to present his claim that Hugh Humerus's book is a first attempt to a theory of religion, not simply as a hypothesis, but what actually Hugh Humerus had in mind. And so to me, yet again, the issue is less about religion, but rather about the way we choose to approach the past about the ongoing arm wrestling of whose interpretation is right or closer to what actually happened or what a text really meant. Despite scholars identifying the existence of gaps in the historical archive, one of the ways that they, are try, they try to bridge the fragmented knowledge about past material, such as, for example, a text, as I have already mentioned above, is by looking at its context a move that we see in actually all the authors that I have uh, discussed so far. So indeed, Rubekas too tries to contextualize the text, and I should say the text because we don't really have it, uh, through a selection of primary and secondary sources. In doing so, he's able to offer a historical narrative of the ancient world in an effort to place and correctly interpret Euhemerus's work, concluding that Code, it was within such an intellectual context that Euhemerus of Messini introduced his own approach to religion. End code. The problem, though, is that the context of the text in which such scholars arrive by means of selecting so called primary and secondary sources and by piecing together in their description and narratives those sources is actually of their own making. Failing to see that, as Brown wrote about historical narratives, such contexts are, quote, made largely in retrospect and thus subject to the inventive, occluding, refractive ramifications of retrospection, end quote. In my reading of this, it seems that no matter how many sources we piece together in our effort to construct the context of a text or how carefully we read primary sources, we never really are in, say, Euhemerus' time, nor the setting in which 
a text was composed. To put it another way, we never have an unhindered glimpse into the world, let, uh, let alone the minds and intentions of authors long dead. In other words, the ancient context into which we work so hard to read our artifacts to better understand them are also ours. Which means that, although we may acknowledge that artifacts can be distorted by our modern and therefore anachronistic concepts, such as religion, we mistakenly think that the context in which the artifacts, whether text, statue, body, etc., is placed and consequently understood or read by us in the present is not equally of our own doing as well. I would not argue that the four examples that I have discussed so far are the same. While Michelson and Rebecca's, in different degrees, rather traditional and nonetheless problematic assumptions about the ease with which we can, discern, we can describe past realities prior to even using modern theories to understand them better, might be painfully evident to someone inclined to support Brown's focus on representation, Nongpri, as well as Barton Bujarin's much celebrated critical studies, I think fall into the same sort of trap. Despite how these later books have been received, I find their methodological option for approaching the past, that is substituting terms to unveil actual, the actual past, not particularly progressive inasmuch as it is reminiscent of a previous scholarly effort to retrieve origins. In other words, it seems, at least in my reading of these scholars, that our only option is going on an origins quest to describe better the ancient world as it was experienced or lived by the ancients themselves, as if by using some imaginative device we can overcome the historical gulf. So, in fact, despite the supposed methodological progress promised by the work of Nongbri and that of Barton and Boyarin, we are only debating who has a more informed grasp of the past, failing to see that the critique of a situated and invested nature of a previous traditional scholarship may equally apply to us as well. So, whether armed with a category religion or having throwing out in favor of some other and no less modern conceptual tool, scholars fail to see that they inevitably go to the data with preset criteria that would determine which of the material artifacts from the almost limitless archive of the past will satisfy their curiosities and therefore be useful to their study. Simply put, the data don't determine the scholarly choices, but instead the, those choices and the concept, concepts scholars use will determine what will be constituted by them as particular sorts of data. Uh, for as Brown wrote, quote, concepts are products of scholars' cognitive operations to be put to work in the service of scholars' theoretical interest in the objects of their study of their research. Concepts are not given off by the objects of our interest. They neither descend from the sky nor sprout out of the ground for our plugging." End quote. The implication of this is that a different choice of categories of concepts does not give us any better that is closer to the original insight into the ancient world itself, since we cannot think outside of our own classifications, outside of our own linguistic schemata. Rather, opting for different ways of seeing the past, such as, for example, calling what we study culture instead, is a way of answering different theoretical questions in the present. Furthermore, the whole idea of letting the ancient voices be heard on their own terms, something that is especially prominent in Barton Boyarin's book, no less than Rebecca's and Michelson's more traditional approach, when the question asks for the sources, they are necessarily products of the scholars themselves, is therefore where to me the issue lies. For not only do we risk, as Russell McCutcheon argued, by code and critically reproducing instead of studying local classification system will lead to us as scholars normalizing participant distinctions and the interests that drive them, end quote. But even worse, and despite the thousands of years that divide us from them, we will mistakenly think that our concepts 
our organizations and the knowledge that derives from them, all used in how we live in this modern world, are necessarily universal that they somehow transcend time and space, or that they are in fact in sync with some past reality. Certainly, as, I implied, as implied above, I consider Nongbri's book, as well as Barton and Boyarin's, to be significant contributions in the ongoing discussions regarding the problem of using religion as a descriptive term in the study of the ancient world. However, all four of them are examples of a persistent problem in our dealings with the past. As I already hinted, the search for the Holy Grail. That is the search for searching a point where we will be able to describe the ancient world free of misconceptions, free of discourse and simulacra, that is, representations. In other words, all four books are examples of a longing to return to the origins, whether that is a period or a text, in order to retrieve what actually happened or to find its actual meaning. Failing to see, as Brown argued that, quote, our dealing in past is itself a moment of historical production that is rife with special interests that do not belong in the past at all, end quote. Whether we use alternative concepts that we assume they describe better past worlds or means or by means of context, which in the end they are also the result of our creative imagination, as it has been argued also by the well-known historian Hidden White. But I understand that all of this also raises some very pressing questions. How do we then study the ancient world? Can we say anything about the past? In other words, how do we move forward in our studies without moving backwards? Being mindful that lacking the power of errors to fly between gods and mortals, ensuring the correct message is conveyed despite the gaps and inevitably faulty transmissions, I would suggest that we, and by we I mean scholars, ought to be a little more modest in our claims about the past, a past that forever springs from our narratives rather than from the head of Zeus. Obviously, perhaps, I'm no proponent of working to identify some original point in time against which everything can be measured. The original is lost, if that is ever, if there is ever an original, and it is not merely probably lost. What we are left then are layers of readings, descriptions and interpretations of texts, what Brown, borrowing from Jean Baudrillard, calls simulacra, each one of which reflects the time when those were produced, thereby serving different, possibly contradictory, interests. Consequently then, I'm not against offering our own descriptions and interpretations of the data we uh, each study, and that's why I find Nong Briz and, Car and, and Barton and Boyarin's book very uh, important because of the alternative interpretations they are offering. Because as scholars this is what we do, but we should take seriously that they are always situational, stemming from a specific present context that we need to take seriously in the narratives, interpretations and descriptions that we produce, making them no more authoritative than other interpretations, given that they can never be any closer to any kind of stable exterior or pre-representational reality. Relying on Brown's work then, at least in my reading of it, I would like to point out five things that I have already hinted thus far in this paper that we need to take more seriously in order to move forward and towards a shift of approach in the way we study the ancient world and the past in general. The first one is self-awareness. I would suggest, contrary to Michelson, that any encounter with material sources begins with contemporary interests and theoretical questions that not only pre-exist that encounter, but also informs the choice of concepts by which we in the present transform past material into particular kinds of artifacts, that is, data to be studied. We therefore have to be self-aware, self-reflexive, 
or self-conscious, as Jonathan Z. Smith phrased it in the opening of his 1982 book, Imagining Religion, that all the categories by which we will organize, classify, and then interpret, talk about the ancient world, and the meanings we will later ascribe to its actors are ours. So we are not just dealing with problems associated with the word religion, let alone the many terms that we routinely relate to that word, such as myth, ritual, cult, sacred, gods, beliefs, etc. Not to mention all of the ancient words that we want to use instead to name such much the same items in the past, such as Iero, Efseves, Friskia, because sooner or later we will have to translate those ancient words in a way that makes sense to us. Furthermore, we have to be self-aware of the various terms that we sometimes substitute for religion, yet often don't bother to think about as much, such as nation-states, gender, ethnicity, economics, power, culture, identity. I mean, it's, we use all sorts of anachronisms when we are talking about the past. So our first task then is to be self-aware that the concepts we use to describe uh, other people's worlds are ours and therefore the descriptions of a world so remote to our own comes already with certain interests that are located in the present. Failing to do so means that we risk falling into the very thing we critique other scholars of doing. Second positionality. Related to self-awareness is the idea of positionality in the process of historical production and representation. On many occasions, Brown argues that dealings with the past have more to do with interest in the present. As he argued, quote, there is no place to hide from the imperative to take responsibility uh, for history, both in terms of our lived doings in the present and in terms of how we describe and use the past to rationalize our doings, worldviews, social arrangements, and the multitudinous instrumentalities, material and symbolic, by which we contrive powerful, tangible worlds in accordance with our imagined words, worlds." End quote. In other words, as just argued, substituting the category religion with some other words that are no less situated in the present, therefore equally modern, does not really solve any problems to me. Doing so simply perpetuates the problem of failing to see that our descriptions are always situational and thereby constitute the object that we think we are only passively witnessing. A situation similar to this would be the modern criteria and debates that determine what gets to be displayed in a museum's exhibit case. For the inattentive museum visitor, fails to see the choices that led to this and not that being put behind the glass and displayed, thereby rendering invisible the absent curator who actively constituted the past through which visitors stroll. In fact, simply getting rid of the word religion and substituting another word or a cluster of words, as Barton Boyaring suggests, that better correspond to ancient people's organizational schemes implicitly supposes that ancient material artifacts have fixed and hidden meanings and relationships that should we be using the wrong tools, we are just unable to fully grasp and access. Three, exposure of gaps and processes. Our efforts then ought to be directed not so much towards filling in the inevitable gaps of history with our narratives, but instead, as Brown phrased it, quote, expose the complexities of history making, end quote. That is, the various ways by which the past is fabricated in the present, the way it is represented via different discursive techniques. Our efforts should therefore be towards observing and exposing the often unnoticed processes of the discursive practice itself, the discourse on religion being but one among many. Seeing the past not as a, as, as a stable entity that we need to discover and access with better vocabulary and having little interest in trying to imaginatively bridge the historical gap, we should instead try to identify and expose those gaps and discontinuities that gave rise to the emergence of specific discursive narratives that constitute a certain sort of past by means of this or that type of representation. 
Making the shift means then that the discourse on religion, ethnicity, gender, tradition, etc. are always seen to be our very object of study and not our redescriptive analytical tools by which we still evaluate, uh, by which we eventually see what is or better was actually there to see. While this shift is usually confused with an effort to correct the misunderstandings and misinterpretations of previous scholarship, I propose instead that contemporary claims of so-called distortions or misunderstandings be understood themselves as curious representations that should attract our attention, seeing them as but more parts of the process of history making, that is, ways by which authorized artifacts are made. In making this shift, then, there is no substantial distinction between so-called primary and secondary sources, since the latter are part of the ongoing process of making the former into a particular kind of simulacra. In fact, I would go so far as to say that without so-called secondary sources, there are no primary sources. Artificiality. As Brown argues, can take many forms, but one that he discusses is amnesia. Following Michel Roth to Yo, he argues that the loss happens in at least four stages of historical production. A, making the facts, B, assembling the facts, C, retrieving the facts, D, signifying the facts. Understanding artifacts as part of our making should force us to reconsider the very process by which certain items of the ancient world have been classified, organized and explained under the term religion and its derivative religious. This means that historical narratives should be viewed as processes by which certain items from the archive of the past are selected the process of selection should not go unnoticed, obviously, and become particular types of simulacra in the present, ensuring that artificiality and thus representation are present at every step of the, of the historical production. Last cases in point. In addition to self-awareness, positionality, exposure of processes and artificiality, and there are also many other things than, you know, it's the least is growing. Um, cases in point are a significant step in the shift of approach that I'm trying to envision. Having established that any return to the source, to the origins, if you will, is always anchored in present interest and discourses, then how are we to use and discuss the past? Cases in point are nothing other but an invitation to put our informed and methodologically sound reinterpretations of the sources, our redescriptions of them, in the service of theory. They should serve as examples that will allow us to discuss theoretical issues or pressing questions common across fields such as, for example, power structures, social formation, acts of identification, authority, authenticity, difference, etc., etc. Such a shift on the level of theory will allow us perhaps not just to think about, but to answer the question posed by Brown, quote, why we invest so much in the past and why it is so important that the past looks just so rather than just any old way, end quote. To conclude, Taking into account these five propositions, the focus of our study, not only the study of the ancient Greco-Roman world, should not be anymore on discovering what really happened or trying to expose faulty descriptions of previous generation of scholars, but instead, as phrased by Brown, quote, to understand the human interest and social arrangements in which religious discourses play their various generative and representational roles." End quote. The gains from such a shift of approach can be multiple since it positions, I think, the scholar of religion in such a way so as to contribute to the advancement of knowledge not only among like-minded colleagues, but more importantly, the applicability of methods and theories will prove to be of relevance beyond one's 
own field of expertise while also gaining from the knowledge as it is advanced in other areas and fields within the Academy, making interdisciplinary and inter-area collaborations a natural outcome. In fact, it is this shift of approach that I think encapsulates Brown's mentalité in work, for despite being a scholar of early Christianity, he supervised my own work in ancient and modern Greece, while I was pursuing a PhD at the University of Alberta. He thereby helped me to understand that, quote, the study of religion is more like an organized, specific purpose field trip into the general region of social and cultural processes than it is a fenced-in disciplinary or departmental acro with its own non-shared special to religion methods." End quote. Thank you.